auditory evoked potentials. We use them to assess hearing acuity on patients, and particularly pediatric patients, but it is not a behavioral hearing test. So someone like Dr. Krista Reeves, who will be here on November 3rd to talk about CAPD, she might say, no, 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 that's not a real hearing test. The only thing that's a true hearing test is a behavioral hearing test like you would do pure tone audiometry. But these things are, all, all are used every day to assess hearing and the results are either consistent with hearing loss or consistent with normal hearing even though it's not a behavioral hearing test. Naturally, if there's a finding, a behavioral hearing test would be the goal to actually do that as soon as it's possible. But if we're testing a newborn, it might be a couple of years before we could actually do a behavioral hearing test, even if it's the type of behavioral hearing test where VRA is used, visual response audiometry, like a toddler, right? Okay, so um, the chances of you using some type of auditory evoked potential, evoked means that it's evoked by the stimulus. The patient didn't do anything. Um, the chances of your using one of these is very high. Um, autoacoustic emissions is an auditory evoked potential, autoacoustic emissions, and another one is auditory brainstem response. We'll talk about both of them, but especially about autoacoustic emissions because every school system has autoacoustic emissions equipment. Your clinic here, I believe, has autoacoustic emissions. If not, they um, will buy that as soon as there's an audiologist. But many speech pathologists use this test equipment. Many pediatricians do as well. Um, every school system in metropolitan Atlanta has that type of equipment. Okay. Um, many school systems, even if they don't have an audiologist, they have that. So why would you do autoacoustic emissions? The primary purpose of autoacoustic emissions, which is abbreviated OAE, is to determine the status of the cochlea, the hearing organ, especially the outer hair cells, which, which are a critical part of the organ of hearing, the cochlea, right? Because these outer hair cells actually produce this emission that we're going to measure in the ear canal, right? And we could use autoacoustic emissions to screen hearing. In newborn infants, neonates, it's used very commonly. Many, many hospitals that have newborn nurseries have autoacoustic emissions, and that's how they screen the hearing on newborn babies. Of course, you can't do a behavioral hearing test. You can't tell a newborn baby in an intensive care nursery to press the button when they hear the tone. Um, you have to do something like autoacoustic emissions, right? So to screen hearing on neonates, that's newborns, or older infants, or individuals with developmental uh, disabilities who can't respond to a behavioral hearing test. You would rather do a behavioral hearing test, but sometimes you can't. Uh, you could also partially um, estimate hearing sensitivity, okay? So it's not a measurement of hearing acuity, but you can have some idea of hearing sensitivity over a limited range, right? You could differentiate between a hearing loss that is sensory neural, a sensory hearing loss, a dysfunction of the inner ear, uh, and uh, some other type of hearing loss might be conductive. Uh, or it might be, it might not, it might be beyond the inner ear, something wrong with the auditory nervous system to help differentiate between those. Or to test for a functional hearing loss. A functional hearing loss is when somebody is faking a hearing loss, right? So those are the uses of autoacoustic emissions. This is a good slide to know. 
And just to explain how it works, the normal cochlea, that's the organ of hearing, doesn't just receive sounds, it actually creates a sound. So an autoacoustic emission is a sound that was created by the inner ear. So when we stimulate the inner ear with the right kind of stimulus, and we have a probe in the ear with a, a, not only a speaker in it, but it also has a microphone in it, we could apply the stimulus through the speaker in the probe, and with the microphone we could pick up a sound that the ear makes when it hears this particular stimulus. It actually makes and emits another sound, a second sound. Okay? So these sounds are produced specifically by the cochlea and within the cochlea by the outer hair cells as they expand and contract as a result of the stimulus. We say that the hair cells become motile. In other words, they move and they dance, they vibrate. And the vibration of the little tiny hair cells sends a signal, an, a, a vibration, back through the ossicular chain to the eardrum, which becomes like a speaker within the ear canal, and this tiny, tiny sound can be picked up by the microphone. And if that's present, that is consistent with normal hearing. Okay? I, I put this on here because this shows the outer hair cells within the cochlea. Okay? All right, so... Autoacoustic emissions are as abbreviated OAEs, and there are two types of autoacoustic emissions. They're spontaneous emissions and evoked autoacoustic emissions. The evoked autoacoustic emissions are the ones that are used uh, most commonly. But I will tell you about spontaneous autoacoustic emissions. The evoked autoacoustic emissions happen when you stimulate the ear. They're evoked by the stimulus. The spontaneous autoacoustic emissions happen on their own. There's no stimulus, but those hair cells are dancing on their own. Uh, of the evoked emissions, which we're talking about mainly, there are two types. Transient evoked autoacoustic emissions and distortion product evoked autoacoustic emissions. That's important to know. Transient evoked autoacoustic emissions are named transient because the stimulus is a click. A click like that is considered a transient stimulus. It comes on instantly and goes off instantly. A click. All right? That's why they call it transient evoked autoacoustic emissions or TEOAE, -E, transient evoked autoacoustic emissions. The other type is a distortion product autoacoustic emissions. And that's called distortion, uh, a distortion product autoacoustic emission, or DPOAE, because it's named after its stimulus. We're using a pair of tones, two tones that are presented to the ear simultaneously, and the emission that comes back is a distortion of those two tones, a third frequency. Okay. So we call that distortion product autoacoustic emissions, or DPOAE. So there are two types of evoked autoacoustic emissions. This is simply what spontaneous autoacoustic emissions sounds like. Some people have this, some people don't. We put a probe in the ear, and the probe has a microphone and simply measures what is in the ear in a very quiet environment, like you put the patient in the booth and it's very, very quiet, and you put the probe in there, and you have a spectral analyzer that now looks at what that probe is picking up. And it, this is just background noise, all this stuff, this black stuff. But these peaks are, are actual emissions at different frequencies. They're spontaneous emissions. Probably at least 30% of you in this room have spontaneous emissions but you don't hear them because they're a very, very low level. There are some people that have spontaneous autoacoustic emissions that you could actually hear. If you put a thesoscope or a microphone in the ear and listen to it, you hear 
a tone coming out from the patient for no reason. It's a spontaneous autoacoustic emission. It's rare that it's loud enough that you could actually hear it. But it's common, like 30% of young people like yourself may have something like this. But look at the levels. This is dB SPL minus 10 here, you know, and lower. And that's why you don't hear it. It's actually lower than your hearing sensitivity is even, okay? Uh, so we typically, diagnostically, don't measure this. Sometimes if a patient has tinnitus ringing in his ears, and an audiologist has equipment that will measure spontaneous autoacoustic emissions, they might measure that, and they might find a, sponta a big spontaneous emission at a high frequency, and that's his tinnitus. All right, but that's rare. Tinnitus is usually not caused by spontaneous autoacoustic emissions. Usually it's caused by hair cell damage. Uh, okay. All right. Or and it could be genetic too. It might not be hair cell damage. Uh, so autoacoustic emissions could be used for screening, could be used diagnostically. You could use transient autoacoustic emissions or TEOAE or distortion product autoacoustic emissions, DPOAE, right? Um, transient autoacoustic emissions is used very commonly for screening, especially the screening of infants in hospitals. Every newborn infant in every hospital in the state of Georgia gets a hearing screening. And it is done by either autoacoustic emissions or auditory brainstem response, which we're talking about next, or both, right? Uh, so TEOAE is the most popular means of screening a newborn to determine whether they pass or fail a hearing screening. Uh, if the transient autoacoustic emission is present, um, then they pass. Distortion product autoacoustic emissions can be used for screening also, but they are primarily used by an audiologist for diagnostic purposes uh, because they're more uh, frequency specific, and I'll show you why that is. Are we, uh, are we good so far on autoacoustic emissions of what it is, the two types, transient autoacoustic emissions, distortion product autoacoustic emissions? What is the primary physiological mechanism that produces the autoacoustic emission? What? Outer hair cells. Excellent. Yes. Outer hair cells is the answer. So when that question is on the test, you know the answer, the outer hair cells, right? Within the cochlea. Okay. So we've talked about several things We've talked about how you would evaluate the condition of the outer ear canal, and you would do that by otoscopy, looking in the ear with an otoscope. And you would simply see uh, uh, otitis externa, right? Otitis externa would be an infection of the external ear canal. We call this tissue here uh, the external meatus, right? Uh, and we would evaluate the condition of the middle ear, including the eustachian tube, the middle ear cavity, the ossicular chain, and the eardrum. We would evaluate that with a tympanometer, as well as doing air and bone conduction audiometry. Both of those things meant to evaluate the middle ear and assess the ability to conduct, uh, find conductive hearing losses and pathologies of the middle ear. And we would use autoacoustic emissions and OAE evaluation to evaluate the function of the cochlea, the inner ear. Not the auditory nervous system here, not this. Uh, this is the auditory nerve right here. It's sometimes called uh, the sixth nerve, number six, or the auditory nerve. It doesn't evaluate that, but it does evaluate the function of the inner ear or the cochlea 
uh, the organ of hearing, and specifically the outer hair cells within the cochlea. Okay? Uh, these are some common screening handheld autoacoustic emissions devices. These uh, are used um, pretty extensively in uh, pediatricians' offices, in ear, nose, and throat physicians' offices, in school systems, uh, and in newborn nurseries. And I am going to uh, pass around some brochures on uh, some of these autoacoustic emissions units so that you would be able to see some of the features that these things have. Just pass that back. Pass these back. And um, did you get this one? No? Okay, so pass those back and pass these back. So if you looked over that, you would see some of the features and the applications of this type of instrument. These are handheld, typically screening, but they could be screening and diagnostic uh, autoacoustic emissions devices. This is what you would find if you went to the hospital right here in Carrollton and you went into the nursery you would find nurses using these every single day to do hearing screenings on newborns, right? One of the brochures that I passed back there is of this instrument, which is called a CORTI. The only reason I put this slide up here is because um, it has an interesting name. The manufacturer is a company called GSI, which is uh, just an abbreviation of Grayson Stadler Incorporated. That's the last name of the two founders of the company. You don't have to remember that, but your equipment in the clinic here at West Georgia uh, is manufactured by Grayson Stadler. Uh, and w if, they, if they get an autoacoustic emission device, they would probably buy this one because it's the same manufacturer as their audiometer is and their tympanometers. Uh, and it's interesting, they call it a corti because you will find the outer hair cells within the cochlea in the organ of corti, right? Uh, so it was a pretty, pretty appropriate name for this handheld screening device. This isn't much, long, much larger than your uh, smartphone is. Did anybody get a sound level meter app for their iPhone that I talked about last time? No? Well, you can get some of them for free, others for $1.99, an expensive one is $19.95, so they're pretty inexpensive. And it's a good thing for a speech pathologist to have. Um, so if you have an iPhone, you can get a sound level meter and you can determine whether a room is appropriate to do a behavioral pure tone hearing screening in. Right? A quiet room is about 45 dB if you're SPL, measuring it on a sound pressure level meter. Right? All right, so autoacoustic emissions like these, typically handheld devices like this, are used for hearing screenings on all ages of patients very commonly used on newborns in hospitals. Um, it's possible that every hospital in the state of Georgia has some type, one maker, model, or the other, of an OAE, handheld OAE screener. Um, and of course, you can use it on older patients and adults as well. And you might use it on an older patient if for some reason they were disabled and couldn't do a behavioral hearing test and you wanted to get an idea whether their hearing was normal or not. Uh, you might use it if you think they're faking a hearing test. What if you, your hearing test audi audiogram shows a hearing loss and you just have a suspicion 
about this patient for one reason or another and you do autoacoustic emissions and they're totally normal autoacoustic emissions. Well, that doesn't go hand in hand and so then you would want to do some further testing because you suspect a functional hearing loss. Somebody's faking. Um, there are also PC-based, computer-based OAE systems and these typically are, instead of screening, they're clinical. They do more uh, something an audiologist would use to do diagnostic autoacoustic emissions rather than screening. The way this works is there's a probe in the ear and it has a rubber tip on it um, because it's making a seal in the ear, but it doesn't need a pneumatic seal typically like the, a pressure seal like the tympanometer did, but it needs an acoustic seal. So, in, um, so there is some type of ear tip and the user would have to use the appropriate ear tip for the size of the ear canal. And that is technique sensitive. You just have to get used to doing it. See what sizes you are successful with. These systems calibrate to the ear as soon as they start. The calibration takes place in a fraction of a second. But a message comes up if it can't calibrate because you don't have a good seal, a good acoustic seal. So you see that inside the probe, you have several things. You have a microphone that's picking up what's in the ear canal. It's a very sensitive microphone because it's going to pick up this autoacoustic emission. This is the vibration energy of those outer, outer hair cells being transmitted back through the acicular chain to the eardrum, which becomes like a little tiny speaker in the ear canal. These are the very smallest sounds that the human body produces and to be able to measure those is, um, is a marvel of modern uh, technology. So we have a very sensitive microphone and we also have a speaker in there that is producing the, uh, the stimulus. If it's a transient autoacoustic emission system, we have only one speaker that's producing the clicks. The click is the stimulus in a T-E-O-A-E. -E. A click is considered a transient stimuli. And we also have a second speaker if it is a distortion product autoacoustic emissions unit because you need one speaker for each of the two tones that are presented simultaneously in a, in a D-P-O-A-E. Okay? Uh, and, of course, what happens is the outer hair cells are stimulated and when they're stimulated, they become motile, they move, they dance. And as they dance, they create a, a very, very tiny vibration. And that vibration is transmitted back through the ossicular chains, the three bones, to the eardrum. And the eardrum starts dancing or vibrating, creating a sound like a little speaker in the ear canal that can be detected by this very sensitive microphone. And the microphone can distinguish between the stimulus and the actual emission. Uh, okay, I'm going to explain that, how that works. This is an explanation of how distortion product autoacoustic emissions works. Remember I said that DPOAE uses two distinct and different tones as stimulus that are presented simultaneously. Well, here are two tones. One is 1,000 hertz and the other is 1,200 hertz. These two tones are close together. They're close together in frequency. Uh, the ratio between them is close to 1.2. That's why the first one which is called F1 for the first frequency. F1 is 1,000 hertz in this case, and F2 is 1,200 hertz. And of course, we would do numerous frequencies in a DPOAE. I'll show you that in a minute. But this is the test of just one frequency. But we're using two, two different tones that are close together. The ratio between them is 1.2. Uh, we're using them as stimulus. 
And the intensity of them is important too. The intensity of F1 is 65 dB. The intensity of F2 is 55 dB SPL in the ear canal. Okay. Um, now that doesn't mean we're testing hearing at a 65 dB level. We just need that much stimulus to actually evoke this emission. Okay. So those are the only intensity levels we use. Uh, and if an emission happens, then we say that is consistent with normal hearing at that frequency. Right? And what frequency would it be? Well, it would be a frequency close to the F2 frequency. All right? And when you stimulate the ear with those two tones simultaneously, you're stimulating certain specific hair cells along the basilar membrane of the cochlea. Because those hair cells are fine-tuned to different frequencies. Okay? So you're, you are stimulating a set of hair cells which start to become motile. They dance. And as they dance, they create a third tone, which is a distortion product of these two tones. That third tone is a mathematical consequence of these two. It's two times F1 minus F2. So two times F1, that's 2,000, minus 1,200 is 800. So we would expect a third tone to be present and picked up by this microphone. Not only the two tones that are the stimulus, one is 65 dB, one is 55 dB, but we expect a third tone, that's the otoacoustic emission. That's being produced by the motility of the outer hair cells. And we know, the machine knows, the software knows exactly what frequency that should be. Two times F1 minus F2. Um, and so it looks there to see if that is present. If it is, there is normal hearing acuity in the range of 1,000 hertz, and in particular at 1,200 hertz. But that's close enough that we're not, we're, we don't care. It's fine. Uh, so that's how distortion product autoacoustic emissions works. Here's a screenshot of a piece of equipment. I did this on my own ear last week when I was creating this class for today. This is showing you what's going on in the ear. This horizontal axis is frequency, and this is intensity in dB SPL, decibels, sound pressure level. This is what the microphone is measuring in the ear, a spectral analysis of it. Here are the two tones, F1, 65 dB, and what is it, about 3,500 hertz. And here's F2, maybe around 4,200 hertz. Uh, anyway, they are being applied. This is 55 dB. This is 65 dB. These are being applied to the ear by the probe simultaneously. And then the machine knows to look right here where this dotted line is, which is 2 times F1 minus F2, right? And it expects to find this. This is just background noise right here. But this is an emission because it's occurring exactly at that frequency we expect it to occur at, and it is above the overall noise level around it. It's higher than the noise level. And so we do this at several pairs of frequencies. We do it at a pair of frequencies close to 1,000, and 1,500, and 2,000, and 3,000, and 4,000, and in this case, 6,000. So we did six frequencies here. This, an audiologist does this very typically. And the machine plotted the level of the emission. How high, how strong was this emission? Now look at this emission. It's about 7 dB right here. In fact, what is it exactly? I'll tell you. Oh, uh, it's, it, it's below zero. This emission is, is just... 0.1 minus 0.1 dB. You see how small this is? This is the smallest, weakest detectable sound in existence, practically. It's very, 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 very uh, soft sound. But it has, 
it was detected, and it's above the noise. The noise level is plotted down here. This, at this frequency, this is the noise level, this stuff right here. So it plots the level of the emission, that's how high is this, many times below zero. Um, you know, I've had this happen where the phone rings, even drawing a Sunday mass, I'm a minister, um, and, every, and when it did, I didn't know what to do. All the people are going, oh, you yell at us for having our cell phones go off during church, and yours goes off? So I go, uh, yes, Archbishop. <laughs> um, well, I'm a little busy now. Could you call back? You know, they get a kick out of that. Because right. I tell them to put their phones on silent ahead of time. Okay, so um, we've plotted the level of the actual emissions here. And we've plotted the level of the noise. The reason we want to know the level of the background noise, because if the patient's making a lot of noise, uh, and that background noise is as high or higher than the emission itself, now we don't know whether there's an emission or not. It is drowned out by the noise level. The only way we know there's an emission, if it's above the noise, if this noise, the background noise, was way up here, we don't know whether there's an emission or not. It is hidden in the background noise. So to do this test, the patient has to be quiet. It cannot be done on a noisy patient. So if you go into the intensive care nursery and the baby is screaming, we don't even put the probe in the ear. What we do like to do it is when the baby is sleeping. And of course, when you put the probe in the ear, it wakes the baby up, but that's okay once they once they get used to feeling that in their ear, they will typically fall asleep again and you can hit start. And it's applying these tones of frequencies, a pair of tones at this frequency, a pair of tones at this frequency, a pair at this. In this case, they tested four frequencies between 1,000 hertz and 6,000 hertz and they got emissions like that. And we knew they were emissions because the noise level, which is green here, this is the average of the noise down here, this stuff. It is well below the actual level of the emission. There's a, there is an adequate signal to noise ratio between them. And so we say that that is an emission that exists and is normal and it's consistent with normal hearing, hearing within the normal range uh, from 1000 hertz through 6000 hertz. The patient didn't have to respond whatsoever and we found out something about his hearing acuity. Not a behavioral test, not a true hearing test, but it indicates normal function of the cochlea, the outer hair cells, the middle ear too. If there was a middle ear pathology, it wouldn't work, you know? So if we got no emissions, we'd have to rule out middle ear pathology that's preventing those slight vibrations in the cochlea being transmitted back through the acicular chain to the eardrum, right? Um, these dotted lines are just the ranges of normal. In this, these ranges of normal, uh, Dr. James Hall and I did a, a research study to determine those on graduate students at Vanderbilt University back in the 90s. And we came, this is just the, the mean plus two standard deviations, these dotted lines. So an audiologist says, hey, if I get emissions that are in between these dotted lines, they're normal because that's what we got on our 23-year-old students with normal hearing. We tested their hearing first. And this dotted line here was our average noise level, but we did it in a booth. When I was doing this, it was outside of a booth. But I got low enough noise. So I said, if my noise was way up here because the patient was making noise or there was ambient noise in the room, then this test would not be valid. I don't know whether there's an emission or not. You can only do it under quiet circumstances. Um, and here are just the plot of the two levels of the two tones, the 65 dB tone and the 55 dB tone. And because these lines are flat, that tells me that's normal. This is just a crazy sound that's used to, for calibration when it starts, just so it has the levels right in the ear canal. Okay? That make, make some kind of sense? 
An audiologist could do this if they wanted to. They can map the cochlea. This is called cochlea mapping. They did autoacoustic emissions at many, many frequencies. This is done at at least 30 or 40 frequencies. All these X's, X's is on the left ear, circles are the right ear, right? Red is right and round. Um, and these are the noise levels. There's a good signal to noise level. If I was looking at this, I'd say this, this, this means normal hearing between 1,000 and 6,000 because I have emissions that are above the noise. The noise is sufficiently low where this is valid. And those emissions are present, and they're not only present, they're in the normal area, which would be between these two lines. Um, and I did a lot of frequencies, not just 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, or, or not octaves or half octaves. I did many, many frequencies. An audiologist that's looking for uh, sometimes there's a, a dead area in the cochlea, or there's an area that is of hair cells that are damaged and they're causing tinnitus, and you get emissions that drop down, a sharp drop just in one particular area. I'll bet you that's an area with damaged hair cells, and it's an area that's causing the patient's tinnitus at that frequency. They're ringing in the ears. Uh, so this, is, this would be diagnostic distortion product autoacoustic emissions. This is what the typical graph would look like. It's called a DP gram, distortion product uh, graph, DP gram. Here's a screening. This audiologist did a screening while well, it was just me on my left ear, which is my good one. Uh, anyway, this particular screening software said pass here. I didn't have to determine that it passed. It determined it itself because it's programmed to know that an emission is valid if it is uh, above the noise by at least 6 dB or more. And so it measured the level of the noise at each frequency and the level of the emission. That's the level of the emission, the peak of that. Um, and, uh, and each one of the frequencies, or at least three out of four, that's typically what they do is test four frequencies, and at, three, at least three of the four have to be valid emissions. A valid emissions means that it is at least 6 dB above the noise. If the, no if the noise level is low and the emission is low, it's right down there with the noise, then there are no emissions. And this would say not pass, it would say refer. We don't like to say fail. Fail's a bad word, it's, word. it's not politically correct, so we say refer uh, because we're going to refer for further testing. Um, and um, so that would be a typical screening. This is different. This is a TEOAE. The ones we looked at previously were DPOAEs, distortion product autoacoustic emissions. This is a TEOAE, transient evoked autoacoustic emission. And um, what, I'll explain what we're seeing here. This is the actual response. Uh, this is what the ear makes. This is a graph, and you don't see anything down here, but it, it is simply frequency here on the horizontal axis and intensity dB SPL on the vertical axis. And they actually did two sets of clicks. They put in the first click and saved the response in a memory, and then put in the next click and saved the response in a memory. And they would all the patient would hear is a bunch of very rapid clicks, click, 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 and within a few seconds, that would be a few hundred clicks, the average is displayed. And the, there are two memory banks, A and B, and they're superimposed on each other. And so a normal response, if I looked at this, I'd say this is a response because A and, P, a and B replicate. If they didn't replicate, you would have to investigate. Um, but A and, P, A and B replicated. These are practically superimposed, these two waveforms. They were simply done by the first click went into one memory, the next click went into a second memory. The memories are A and B. We do an average of several hundred clicks 
and this happens in just a couple of seconds, and the average is displayed, memory A and B superimposed on each other. So I could look at this and say, that's a response. This is the calibration. Um, I'm not going to get into that. But this is what the click looks like on a, uh, a, a time scale. This is time across here. And this is what it looks like on a spectral analysis. It's a broadband stimulus rather than the tones, which are frequency specific. So it's a broadband stimulus, and its band is about 700 hertz to about oh, 3,000 hertz. And this graph here is showing this blue for left ear. Blue is left and red is right, as always. Uh, but this blue graph, this blue stuff is emissions. And this black stuff under it is the actual noise, the ambient noise, the background noise in the ear canal. It's a result of the physiological noise of the patient, any vocalization from the patient, and of course, whatever outside noise is measured. But when this emission exists, I see it, it's, it's, and it's well above the noise level, then this patient passes, and this is a screening instrument, so it says pass. Right? This is a normal transient otoacoustic emission. It's normal because I can see it here above the noise. It's normal because I can see it here, and it replicated. These two waves are superimposed on each other, and I could hardly tell the difference between A and B. Um, and I have a table here that tells me uh, what it did is a spectral analysis on this broadband stimulus. The stimulus contained multiple, intense, multiple frequencies, from a, at least from 1,000 to 3,500. And what it did is it did a spectral analysis of each uh, 1,000 hertz, 1,500 hertz, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. It, it did these in half octaves, and it analyzed this the frequency component of this response, the, the emission that came back from those hair cells. Uh, a broad band of them were vibrating and producing this. And when they did the spectrum analysis, they're looking at different frequencies. At 1,000 hertz, the reproducibility between A and B here was 98%. At 1,500 hertz, the reproducibility of A and B is 99%. When reproducibility is greater than 70% or greater, an emission is said to be present, okay, in TEOAE. So an emission is present at 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, and, and 3,000, because the reproducibility is greater than 70%. An emission is not present at 4,000, because the reproducibility is only 19%. But the overall reproducibility in the broad band of this stimulus and the broad band of the response, the response is a broad band response, in the frequencies of 1.2 to 3.5 K hertz, 1200 hertz to 3500 hertz, the overall reproducibility is 37, 97%. Of course, that's over 70, well over 70, and the patient is said to pass. The emission is present. It is consistent with normal hearing acuity within that frequency range. That's how transient autoacoustic emissions happens. So this is a patient that passes. What does one look like that fails? Um, here's that table I just explained to you how the reproducibility factors over 70% at each one of these frequencies, so they pass. Here's somebody who failed. Now, the first one I showed you I did in my left ear, which is my good ear. Um, this I did just in a cavity, not in somebody's ear. So I was trying to just come up with, but this is what it would look like in an ear that had no autoacoustic emissions, either because there was a conductive disorder a middle ear disorder preventing the vibration from being transmitted, or there was a sensory neural hearing loss, damaged hair cells, right? Uh, because I don't see an A and B here response that replicates. This is just plain background noise that averaged out over several hundred very rapidly applied clicks.
right, within a few seconds, I got this. This is no response. And there's nothing on this graph because there's no response. And if I looked at these numbers, the reproducibility at these different frequencies, zero or very low, certainly well below 70, which you would have to have to say an emission exists at that frequency. This is basically how transient autoacoustic emissions are analyzed. The main range of testing is limited to from about 1200 hertz to 3500 hertz. That's why it's used for screening. If you want to do frequencies in a wider range, DPOEs, you can actually test from 500 hertz to 10,000 hertz if you wanted to. And it's frequency specific where this is generally not frequency specific, but we make it frequency specific at least within that limited range by doing a spectral analysis of the response and looking specifically mainly at reproducibility. I hope that makes sense to you. Does it? Yes? Okay. All right. Here's another, uh, just another instrument that did the same thing. It was doing um, transient autoacoustic, oh, I was doing distortion product autoacoustic emissions. And it's just showing it in a different way with a bar graph instead of a conventional graph. And the bar graph is showing um, this gray, these gray bars are the background noise. And these black bars above it are the actual emissions. And here's the numbers. At 1,000 hertz, uh, now, of course, it used two frequencies close to 1,000 hertz because it's distortion product of acoustic emissions. Um, and the, the level of the actual emission when those two tones were applied, the level of the actual emission was 11.9 dB, okay? Uh, the noise was minus 0.6 dB. The signal to noise ratio, or how high the emission was above the noise, was 12.6 dB. If these numbers are above 6, in other words, the emission is at least 6 dB over the noise, then that's normal. So I can see emissions, all these black things are emissions at all these frequencies. So this patient has, you know, in this frequency range, which is 1,000 to 8,000, this patient has OAE results, DPOAE results that are consistent with normal hearing acuity. Um, and the patient didn't have to respond at all. The ear responded by itself by producing that emission. If the noise levels were too high, if these gray bars were up to the top here, I, then I don't know if there's an emission behind the noise or not. I have an invalid test, it's too noisy. But if the noise level is low, like below zero like this, and there's no black bar above it, my signal to noise ratio is close to zero or at least not greater than six, then there's no emission there, and that is consistent with uh, some type of hearing loss, at least a mild loss, uh, not normal hearing at that frequency. Okay. So many of the screeners are like this. The screener, person doing the screening in the hospital to the infants, knows less about autoacoustic emissions than you do. You know as much as an audiologist knows now about autoacoustic emissions. Uh, but all they know is they see this word pass or refer. And they really don't know what these numbers mean or these bars or, or these waveforms mean. But you do um, because we told you. So you know more about autoacoustic emissions, tympanometry, and audiometry than you ever wanted to know. Uh, but that's, it's, it's very good because then the relationship between speech pathology and audiology is good and you can work together. Uh, here is another test. Would you say this was normal transient autoacoustic emissions by looking at it? Yeah. Yes, certainly, because um, you can see A and B here, and you can almost can't tell that there's two waves. It's superimposed on one another. Um, and up here is an analysis of that. The black is emission above the gray, which is noise. And here's the individual frequencies when they do a spectral analysis. And at each one of these frequencies, from 1,000 to 5,000, um, there is at least 70% of reproducibility in here. 
when they do a spectral analysis of the response. Very good. So if a newborn is screened with autoacoustic emissions, here's what happens. If they pass, well, then they pass, and the parent is told to just do uh, routine well baby checkups and follow-ups and observe their response to noise. And uh, in fact, many times they'll give them a chart, things to look for so that they can see if the baby is responding to sounds normally as it ages, okay? Uh, but otherwise, there is nothing more that would be done. If a patient fails, then the test is typically repeated after about one week uh, or after the ears are cleared out. Many times a baby will fail an autoacoustic emission screening in a hospital because there is what's called vernix in their outer ear canal. So their outer ear canals are not clear so that measurement can't be made properly and they fail the test but it's a false positive uh, and so if that happens, the, they don't immediately go to uh, the doctor or an audiologist. Typically, the test is repeated after at least a week. It could be more than a week, it could be two, three weeks, but it's repeated because uh, you give time for the ears to dry up after they were born. Uh, usually, they're only in the hospital for one day, you know, so sometimes the, there's fernix in the ear canal. Um, and so if they pass the rescreening, that's at, we, at least a week after that, sometimes the hospital says bring the baby back or they say go to your pediatrician. Or the, and every hospital staff, the nursing staff knows where locally they would have the retesting done. Carrollton ENT, which are a group of ear, nose and throat doctors here in Carrollton, is an example of a facility that would do the retesting. Uh, and uh, if they pass, then you do the same here, just well baby follow-up. If they fail, then there has to be a plan for further testing because they failed the follow-up testing, the second test, uh, and they would have to go see an audiologist.